Our next speaker is Dr. Lakshmi Gold. Dr. Gold is an associate professor in the Department of Management. Her research interests include knowledge sharing, learning, and collaboration through information technologies, including blogs, wikis, knowledge management systems, and virtual worlds. Her work has been published in journals such as the MIS Quarterly, Decision Support Systems and Information Systems Journal, and her topic is facilitating situated learning in virtual worlds. Whenever you log on to Second Life, which is one of the virtual worlds, there's just never anyone there. 
right? So that got me thinking about, well, you know, even though we have this, this affordance or disability of situatedness, uh, there's probably something that we need to do to make it work, right? Just because an environment lends itself to situatedness doesn't mean that it's going to work. So I started a series of experiments, and um, my background is computer science, so the first thing I did was build a giant computer up in the air. I thought that was pretty cool, right? I, t I took my students, uh, I walked up those, you see the stairs on the right, we walked up into the tower um, on those stairs, uh, stood on the motherboard so I could explain to them how these cards fit in the, the motherboard, uh, how the heat sinks work, right, how um, cables and, and buses work and all of that. It was a disaster, right? Uh, this was on, on Dell's island. So Dell owned this island where I built that structure. Uh, and Dell would, you know, continuously experiment and reset the, the island so my stuff would just vanish overnight and I'd be stuck with my, my, my students flying in, in the air, right? Uh, also, Dell had an open island, which means anybody could log in. They, they didn't have any restrictions. Uh, so my students would strike up, strike up conversations with people from Brazil, you know, talk about the carnival there, uh, or they would just uh, think that it was interesting to change their avatar's clothes in the, middle of, <laughs> in the middle of the session. So there was a lot of stuff beyond my control that was going on, so there really wasn't much learning happening. Right? So my second set of experiments, I created my own island. Right? I called it IT World, got a new set of clothes, right, more business-like. <laughs> Uh, created my own auditorium, my own lab, uh, and then got students to actually work on a similar task as that big giant computer that I had, but in a more controlled fashion where I had more uh, control on the informational inputs and the social inputs that I was giving them. Right. Uh, this, I mean, I, I kind of skipped through all the different iterations of experiments I did, but there were a whole bunch of them, so there was a lot of data generated from this. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on my research model and all the cool hypotheses, but the big piece in there that I got out of this was that situated learning. I couldn't measure this thing. So while these theories in the 70s and 80s had suggested that this is important, we still hadn't done anything to actually measure it and say, okay, this is what this means, right? It's not like a test you take where what is the RAM, what is wrong, what is the, you know, what does RAM expand to? Right, this is where you're measuring the deep learning. How do people make sense of things in their head that is a culmination of all these different inputs that they're getting, right? And the other cool thing that I got from these experiments was that I could actually influence that situated learning. So I, I didn't just, uh, you know, just, it, just leave it to chance that it would happen just because they're in this cool new environment. I could actually manipulate things like their social awareness, uh, their contextual awareness by changing the social inputs they were getting, by changing the informational inputs they were getting, right? Uh, so I could actually design for this. Uh, so those were kind of, you know, the building blocks of my research is that now I could measure situated learning and I could influence it. Now the next step was, well, so how does this apply to the real world, right? What do I do with this? These are just building blocks. So we sat back and thought about what does this really mean? And I said we because uh, these experiments were me with a with with few co-authors of mine, so it was a very long involved research project. One of the first implications was this idea of a place, right? Uh, if you remember in the early 2000s, there was a book by the Harvard Business School called From Space, no, From Place to Space. Uh, Peter Weil and Michael Vitale, New York Times bestseller, seller, did really, really well. But the idea was that we are now moving away from these geographic places to these decontextualized, decontextualized electronic spaces. So everything's gonna go on the internet, right? That was the next big thing. Well, there's a fundamental difference between a place and a space. A place is something that you attach some meaning to. What you expect when you walk into a place that is a coffee shop is very different from what you expect in a place that is a library or an auditorium. You have different expectations from the place based on the inputs that you see in these places. When we remove all of that, we have no expectations, we have no meaning attached to that place, which is problematic because you're getting away from the situated learning. You're only relying on one set of inputs, which are those information inputs. 
right? So now we could think about moving back to this idea of the place by adding that context in there. Another thought was, well, how does this affect decision making, right? And this is my business school side kicking in. Well, so what does this mean in practical terms for organizations that have these virtual teams that are doing uh, geographically dispersed stuff online? Does the decision making of these teams fundamentally differ from geographically co-located teams because of the difference in the, the social and the contextual inputs? And we found out that yes, there is a difference, right? Which is also now problematic because a lot of organizations are moving towards telework and, and virtual work, right? And then a third line of thought is why do people use technologies or why do people use platforms? Why do people like Blackboard and screen for example, right? And traditional research tells us that there are two primary reasons why people use the technology. One is because of the information it provides, so it's useful to you. And the second is because of the system itself, because it's easy to use and you know it. What we found out is that there's this third aspect to why people use technologies, which may have, may have nothing to do with the inputs that they're getting, right? So it may be completely useless from a practical perspective. Uh, and it may be very difficult to use, but they still use it because it fulfills some kind of social need for them, right? So there's a sociability aspect to technology which had not really been considered uh, up until very recently. Right. All right, so that's as far as the research stuff I, I did say it would be brief. Uh, now I'd like to talk to you about, very briefly, about two projects that, that I worked on which had some practical implications based on all the stuff I covered. Uh, and this one was um, uh, at the Hong Kong Police Department. I was involved in a project where we were trying to design effective learning environments for their crime scene investigators, right? So the way they traditionally did it, uh, they had two options. They either created this mock physical crime scene where you walked in and they had these dummies and dead bodies and red paint splattered over the walls and, and, and that stuff. And that had some limitations, right? There's only so many mock physical rooms that you can set up with, with so many options of crimes that you could represent, right? It, it was a huge task uh, to change these, these settings, and it took a lot of resources to do that, right? Also, you couldn't really capture that learning process, right? You couldn't go back and say, well, you know, after about half an hour, you should have probably asked this question or looked for this clue couldn't really review that process. So they used to supplement it with uh, electronic options like videos, right? So they had these pre-recorded videos of information, but again, that static information that's not really covering all the contextual cues. I mean, you can imagine that this particular application needs you to really absorb the contextual cues, right? And that was not happening in these, these videos or this text that they were looking at. So uh, what we did was design um, a mock crime scene in, in, in Second Life, a virtual world. So we had you know, a dead body there, and this is not showing up very well, but footsteps and blood and all of that. So the trainees, the investigators, would go in and you know, basically review the crime scene, ask the right questions, look for clues. And then later on, the trainers would come in and say, well, you, know, you could have done this differently. What the simulation also added was that any, at any time during that process, they could change it up. So somebody else could log in as a victim's family member or you know, a neighbor, and then the trainee would have to improvise and, and, and make sure that they were doing things in the right procedure, you know, keeping in mind the jurisdiction and all of that good stuff, right? Uh, so this was one project which was really, really interesting to work on. A second project, and this was also in Hong Kong, uh, this was a large uh, government um, teaching hospital, actually. And they wanted to train their staff on emergency evacuation procedures. And they also did it traditionally two ways. One way was they actually shut down the hospital and they hired actors and they would kind of role play what would happen in case there was uh, an emergency and they had to evacuate. And you can imagine how impractical and expensive that is to do routinely. Right, so that would only happen once in a while and there would be a lot of staff that fell through the cracks that would not receive their training. The other way they did that was electronic. They had these videos and this material that people would have to read through and answer these, 
radio buttons at the end of it, and you can imagine how little that did to actually teach them what to do when, when, when they had to evacuate. Right? So what we did there uh, was again create uh, you know, a replica, an exact replica. We actually got blueprints of that hospital, um, and we had to get um, another company involved that built this in a proprietary platform. We built the hospital as is, and the, the staff would have to then uh, go through the evacuation procedure uh, through, through those means. Now, now, one disclaimer here is nothing replaces face-to-face. -face, right? Nothing will replace the experience you get of the weight that, that you experience when you lift a body or you, you know, nothing comes close to that. But what we're trying to do is get as close as possible, right, so that we can do it in a practical and a resource conscious way, if you will. Right, and, and this is um, this is one one way we can supplement learning. So that's pretty much what I have. And this is my avatar in Second Life. If any of you ever log in, right. Sonia. Hey. So. <laughs> <laughs> so questions. Let's start with you. Can you make the first available? Um, sure. I could send it to. The theory behind it was really neat. I like that kind of stuff. <laughs> I, I think that's just fascinating. What you've done is just amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So, besides situations where you cannot shut down the hospital or go for in the hospital so you can uh, show the, uh, or shoot some videos to use for training purposes, what else can this be applied? And if you can create a video. Would it be better to create a video or would it be better to create a visual world? Because I haven't created one before, so I don't know how much time is involved in creating those avatars, those uh, constructs. And use the example of uh, the dead, and I'm sure it's taking quite a bit of time to develop those motherboards and things like that. On the reverse, if you had a video with you holding a motherboard in your hands, would it have communicated the same concept? So there, there are a couple of questions there. One is, you know, this versus other things. And that's not how I look at it. Even when I, when I'm, you know, in consulting, when I talk to companies, I'm like, this is not a choice, right? This is how you can complement. So, so for some things, this learning is better. And the some things is where your social cues and your contextual cues are important, right? So one of the projects I didn't talk about was, a, it was also for the Hong Kong Police Department, uh, is, is, for example, the train wrecks. How are you going to do a train wreck in real life? Right? There, there's just no way. Right? Uh, plus, with those many, so you can have a lot of non um, non gaming characters in there, the NPCs that are you know acting as the victims or whatever. So, so you have to think about each situation differently. There's no blanket rule for this, but there, there wherever your social and contextual um, um, elements or inputs are important, I think that this platform can add a lot to that. Right. Uh, the second question is how, how difficult it is. It's really not. I mean, the, the Dell thing, it took me, I didn't even have to call you. There are stores where you can actually go buy stuff. Uh, so there's a whole economy. There's, there's this whole part of virtual worlds that I haven't even touched. They have their own economy. They have um, a, a dollar, Linden dollar, which is fully tradable with the US dollar. One US dollar buys you like 300 million dollars or whatever. So for a couple of cents, you get the whole thing. Uh, I mean, I, I know how to code, but should I spend two hours of my time or should I spend a couple of cents? Yeah, so it's, a, it's really not that difficult. Uh, but the more involved scenes, uh, we actually had professional companies that have their own proprietary 3D software come and build it for us because, yes, that is very, very complex. What kind of experiences did you have trying to get the students? to get into Second Life? I mean, were there problems trying to get an entire class in there, or was it kind of just a small sample for your research? Uh, I had problems on Del, Del's island. Uh, but you know, when you own your own island, you're, you're basically like God, right? Uh, you even control the physics of the island. You can change the gravity. You can change uh, you know, whether people will fly or not, whether they can change their appearance. Right? You can control everything. Uh, and there's a maximum of, I don't know the limit, but it, it's pretty high. So I, I never ran into the limit. I had some pretty big classes in there, and it, it worked with no problem. 
I meant getting for them to sign up and get it. No, it was the, no, they had no problems with anything except listening to a lecture, right? <laughs> <laughs> similar to like virtual worlds like Minecraft, for instance, where people say, no, it's a horrible thing, it causes addiction, but at the same time, it can be argued that it, it hammers on all eight levels of learning, right. uh, like play, social aspects. So would you say that maybe learning was occurring, but just not the learning you had intended? Absolutely, yeah. What, <laughs> also, for our future learners, like what, what are the tools that we need to equip our instructors or our teachers to be able to be relevant because that's, I mean, that's the challenge. Like we're, right. you know, as instructors or as professors, we're, we're steeped in lots of knowledge. Yeah. We know how we can learn it, but how do you translate that in, uh, in uh, the new teaching environment? And I'm not the best person to, to give sort of general advice on how to teach here, but I would say one thing is that, you know, going forward, we have to learn to be tool agnostic. It doesn't matter if it's Second Life, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, screencaster, it doesn't matter. We have to basically just be able to very quickly find what we need that suits what we want to do. And we need to be able to change it pretty quick because we are going to get more and more of these tools on the market in shorter um, kind of iterations and, and we need to be able to keep up with it. So that's probably the only thing I would say.